Um, I can. Here we are on the hour, uh, welcoming you all back from your break. I hope the preaching groups are still going, still going well. Um, I am now going to introduce our next speaker, Ryan Bonfilio is at, uh, on faculty at Candler School of Theology in Atlanta um, at Emory University. And his, uh, his specialty is Old Testament. And today he's going to speak to us about something that I think is extremely relevant and good, deeper information for every deacon to inform your preaching. And that is the Bible and poverty. Um, and I have heard this talk before, and I, I really, really find it very helpful. Uh, so, Ryan, over to you, and we look forward to hearing from you. Wonderful. Thanks, Peter. And uh, to Stephen and Meg and all the others who have been involved in bringing this together, I'm so glad to be with you. Um, as uh, Peter said, I'm coming in from Atlanta, where it's nice and warm. Um, I'm just coming off of a Sunday morning service. My wife is a pastor and I've uh, scurried home after that to be with you all. And it's great to do this. Um, just to, to orient you to me real quickly, I've got a 10 year old son, Leo. He may or may not come running through the door behind me at some point in the next hour. Just wanted to, to name that. Um, I do teach Old Testament at Candler. I love teaching Old Testament. I think these stories are rich and vivid and can bring life to preaching and teaching in the church. But I will say, and Peter, I don't know if you fully know this, but my background is not a traditional Old Testament uh, professor's background. I grew up mostly outside of the church. I went to college as a chemistry major, and my first career was as a college wrestling coach. So it's just, you know, the very standard pedigree, right? Like outside of the church, chemistry, college wrestling, Old Testament. You can just see that connection. And if you're wondering how I got there, um, you're in good company because my parents are still wondering uh, how <laughs> all of that added up. So no matter where you're coming from today as deacons or in other capacities, I think God can make sense of your journey, or at least I'm trying to figure out how that might be uh, true for me. Um, I do love being with you all. I love the ministry and the concept of the of the deacon in preaching, this idea of bringing the concerns of the world to the church and conversely the church to the concerns of the world. I would say, Peter, that I think that should be all preaching all the time everywhere. But you deacons uh, have that special calling to do that. And I hope in a small way to enter that conversation this afternoon and uh, to lift up as Peter mentioned, just one topic, one way that you might help to build that bridge between church and world, world and church. Of course, there's a ton of topics that you might focus on, but I want to look at the topic of poverty, both because it is an area of research and interest of mine as someone who studies the Old Testament, but also because I know how deeply uh, and how significant the problem of poverty is in our world, not just in the U.S., but in many places throughout the world. It is uh, it is of great importance, as many of you all no doubt know, but in my experience, friends, it does not often get a lot of airtime in the pulpit. And I want to wonder about that with you this afternoon, and hopefully in doing so, uh, spur you on to thinking about the topic of poverty as something you might engage in your ministry as deacons. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to transition over to some slides. Um, I only screw this up probably 50% of the time. So give me one second here. All right. And can someone um, give me a thumbs up? Did some slides come through? Good. Thank you, Betty. Yes, we can see them. Excellent. Oh, and one other just sort of um, word or of orientation. Uh, I will not be lecturing for 59 minutes and then pausing for one minute of Q&A at the end. That's just not going to be my style. I'm going to be asking you questions along the way, and you're encouraged to ask me questions along the way. And you can do that either by putting a question through in the chat. You can do the really old fashioned thing and raise your actual physical hand. I will try to see you. Or there's a little digital hand on Zoom that you can use. Um, and if any reason I'm not seeing you, uh, the physical hand or the digital hand, just jump in uh, verbally and let me know. We really want this to be a dialogue uh, back and forth. So with that said, I want to begin by taking you back to a really important but curious moment in church history. It's the late third century. And Rome, which was still the major empire of the day, of the day had a major problem with the early church. 
The problem wasn't that the church was powerful or that it was a threat in any way to the Roman Empire. Far from it. The church at this point was still this marginalized religious movement. Uh, the problem wasn't that the church was a center for education and culture. If it ever was, that's many centuries away. No, the problem, friends, was that the church was making a real difference in the Roman Empire when it came to addressing poverty. Magnetized by Jesus's example and by the witness of the law and the prophets and the epistles, the early church went to incredible lengths to undertake poverty relief wherever the gospel spread. In fact, by the late third century, when the church was uh, what the church was most known for in the non-Christian world was not its theology, its manner of worship, or even the idea of the resurrection. What the church was most known for, if if Jennifer Cross stopped on the street and asked a Roman citizen, what's this whole church business about? What people would have said is poverty relief. That was the signature of the church up through the third century. And this is the really funny thing. This fact irritated Emperor Julian. You see, the church, though a little movement, was making all of Rome look bad. This fringe religious movement with little money, marginal significance, and hardly any power was outdoing the entire empire when it came to poverty relief. And Julian, frankly, was half impressed and half irritated. Uh, so he goes about then setting up this huge movement of developing poverty relief organizations in Rome, not necessarily because he cared a lick about the poor. In fact, I'm not convinced that he did, but because he didn't want to be uh, he didn't want Rome to look bad in comparison to the church. Uh, at this time, friends, poverty relief was at the heart of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. It was front and center in the witness of the church. It was the concern of the world that was most central to preaching in Christendom. Are you with me? It's an amazing picture. Now let's fast forward 1600 years. And for many, many churches in North America, things are much different, aren't they? Let's just shout it out or put it in the chat for uh, a couple, uh, for a moment here. What do you think the church is known for? If you were to stop the average non-Christian Canadian or American citizen, what would they say if you ask them, what do you think of when you think about the church? Just throw a few out there. Being judgmental, Marcus, unfortunately, you are correct. Evangelism. Homophobia. Mm -hmm. Samantha, I think that's right in many experiences. Any others come to mind? What the church is known for if you ask a non-Christian? Being hypocritical. Residential schools. Being stuck up. Uh, passing current atrocities. Not wanting them to grace our doorsteps. Unfortunately, you are all right. If I were to hear <laughs> and asking my 10-year-old son, I think he might say, it's boring or something of that variety. No, I don't know that my my son should be the barometer of how all of North America thinks about the church, but nevertheless, I did hear him say that this morning when we were at church, which is only made worse by the fact that my wife is a minister. And so to say that church is boring, it, that, that hits home a little bit differently. But let's not get into all of that uh, at the moment. You're right, Barna did a study a number of years back asking millennial non-Christians what they thought about the church and really what they reflected was what's exactly like the list you've given us, unfortunately, in the chat. Uh, it's not very positive. And it's nowhere on the list is the idea of poverty relief. Now, this doesn't mean to suggest that uh, churches or Christians aren't involved in poverty relief. There truly are. I know some amazing churches and, and individual Christians who are doing incredible things in the area of poverty relief. But it's not front and center. It is not what the church is known for. It's not what we base our budgets around. It's not what we design our buildings for. Even when and where we do find poverty relief, it's not the main force. So here's the question I want to ask. What did the early church know that we don't or that we've forgotten? Well, why was the early church so convinced that poverty relief was central to the gospel. Why was that? And why have we lost sight of that fact? How is it that the church has become so disconnected from radical care for the poor as a central manifestation of what is truly so good about the good news? 
Friends, that's what I want to answer. We can't fully answer that in, in the short period of time we have, but I want to give you six points that I hope give you some footholds and frameworks for not only understanding what the Bible has to say about poverty, but maybe a little bit of impetus to take poverty uh, into the pulpit with you as lay preachers, as deacons, wherever you are coming from, or maybe it's outside of the pulpit, it's through your teaching or other forms of service in the church. I hope that getting this perspective uh, will help you in that regard. So are you with me so far? Sounds good? All right. Um, oh, and I should mention, too, that along the way, there's going to be some little quizzes. Now, all of my quizzes are pointless quizzes. I mean, that's what my students call them, pointless quizzes. So I take that to heart, and I actually give quizzes that have no points assigned to them, but in fact, I think have a, a good bit of point in terms of learning. So we're going to do that a little bit. And our first pointless quiz uh, is this. How many verses in the Bible are there about poverty? Now, I know it, that's a very difficult question to ask. I don't expect Greg or Bill or Fran to have actually gone through and counted. But if you could give me a ballpark figure, what would you say? How many verses in the Bible are actually about poverty? You can put it in the chat or just shout it out here. What do y'all think? Like 10, more than 10? Where do we want to start the bidding at? 120, Tracy, thank you. 120 going once, 120 going twice. Do I have any more than 120? 250, all of them. Thank you, Trish. Um, that might well be, or one might well read all of the verses in light of the questions of poverty. Um, any other guesses? This is good. Lots sure. and lots. Lots and lots. Thank you for that precision, Steve. That That's exactly right. Lots and lots. That seems like- What I'm all answer. about. Yeah, good answer. Well, I, I find these things very difficult, but I've heard people say, and I think it's reasonable, uh, that about 2,000 verses, at least in the Bible, are about poverty. Jim Wallace, the founder of Sojourners, calls poverty the second most prominent theme in the Old Testament, just behind idolatry. Um, one might even quibble there and say it's more important, in fact, than idolatry. Easily in every book of the Old Testament, there is some discussion of economic justice. Uh, in the New Testament, one out of six verses are about the poor. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke and in Acts, I've heard it said that one in seven verses are about poor. Uh, now, this is just a matter of counting up the verses, but poverty can be a topic in the scriptures even when a verse in English doesn't explicitly reference the word poverty or needy or something like that. Let me give you an example. Have y'all heard of the word or the noun shalom before? It's a Hebrew noun. It's often translated as peace, which is a good enough translation as far as it goes. Although I will say that the concept of shalom in Hebrew is much more expansive than just the absence of war and conflict. It's the presence of God's dream of justice and compassion for the world. It's this wonderfully rich uh, topic. And if Peter had given me the five hours that I'd asked for this afternoon to do this presentation, we could have done a whole thing on Shalom and what that means. But sadly, next time, uh, next time sadly, I only have the three hours. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, so, but here's the cool thing about Shalom. And I bet you've never been taught this before. Uh, in Hebrew, all nouns and Shalom is a noun is, are all nouns are based on verbs. So you can spell that noun a little bit differently and you get a verb. And here's what's really interesting. In Hebrew, that verb, which, by the way, is shalom. So shalom is the noun. Shalom is the verb. You might think that that verb shalom might mean something like to make peace or be peaceful or something related to peace, right? Actually, in Hebrew, friends, shalom as a verb is an economic term. Um, shalom means to pay back or to make whole financially. So let's imagine Marcus has given me a loan. Um, when I pay back that loan, I shalom him. I make him whole financially. And so this idea of shalom that we carry, which is this beautiful concept, at its core, it's based on this idea of economic wholeness or economic justice. So my point here is this. Even in all of those verses that speak of shalom, but they're shalom, but not explicitly about uh, poverty, we might also be inclined to count those verses as verses about poverty, right? And if we do, the number is much, much, much greater than 2,000. 
my point in all of this, uh, to go back to Steve's uh, very precise description, lots and lots of the Bible is about poverty way more than we often think, and certainly way more than we hear about in Sunday school classes and in sermons. Um, what I find striking is that what we as the church end up spending a lot of time talking about is not actually reflective of what the Bible spends a whole lot of time talking about. I find whole denominations splitting over issues that come up two or three or four times in the Bible. And that, that doesn't mean that those issues are unimportant, not by any means. But I do wonder, what if what we what if we gave uh, as much airtime to poverty as scripture does? What would that mean for our preaching? Who might start showing up in our churches? Who might, interestingly, stop showing up in our churches? If we let our language, our teaching and preaching reflect some of the topics that scripture spends a lot of time on. That's something, if we, again, if we had more time, we could stop and unpack. I just want to raise that, though, and, and leave that with you. What if our preaching, uh, the amount of the topics we considered were more deeply reflective of how much scripture spends on poverty? So that's point number one. Um, many of us Although maybe not many of you, I'm not entirely sure, but many of us, and us I mean sort of generically uh, uh, church-going people in North America, are relatively unfamiliar with how much of the Bible is about poverty. Now, we might end there uh, and then just go have coffee for the next 45 minutes into your next time, but I want to build on that and say a little bit more about if this much about Scripture is about poverty, how have we missed it? Why is it? that we don't talk about it more if the Bible talks about it so much. And here I want to do a little experiment. Uh, and to do, to do that, actually, I'm going to stop my share. I'm going to share something else. I'm going to share another screen. But let me give you uh, the ground rules here. In a moment, we're going to watch a video. This is one of my favorite things to do with students at Candler. Um, some of you might have seen this video before. And if you have, my ask is that you play it cool because many other people have not seen this video, right? Um, in the video, you're gonna see a scenario. There's gonna be two teams, each of three players. One team will be wearing white jerseys. Another team will be wearing black jerseys. Each team will have a basketball. Your task to this afternoon uh, is to count how many times the team wearing the white jerseys pass the ball. So three people, they're passing the ball back and forth. It's only about a 30-second video. You have to keep track of how many times the team wearing white passes the ball. Now, I know Fran is saying, well, gosh, this is so easy. I can count. No doubt you can. Uh, and it's actually all not all that hard, except that the team wearing white and the team wearing black are going to be weaving back and forth amidst one another. And so you have to pay really careful attention to not confuse the bounce passes that are within the black team with the bounce passes that are within the white team. So it's not quite as easy as you think, um, but with an august crowd like this, Peter, I expect a really high level of accuracy. After all, these are people who study the text. They're great at paying attention. It's, I'm just, I have no doubt this is going to be fabulous. So give me a second. I'm going to share my screen and then uh, the video will start. And then when we get to the end, I'm going to pause and we're going to uh, publicly share some answers. So hang on one second here. Uh, let me get to the right screen here. Where is it? There we go. Okay. Did that come through all right? Back through? Okay. I, I don't have the volume on. It's okay. There is some audio, but it, it doesn't matter. We can The text will appear on the screen. So count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And here we go. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Now we'll need complete silence for this to augment your concentration. Okay, you're about halfway done. Almost there. Okay, let's get some answers. Let's have a brave soul volunteer. What did you get? How many passes, friends? 15. 15. 
15. 17. 15, 17. Liz has 16 in the chat. 10, 14. Uh oh, Peter, there's a little more variance here than I was anticipating. Um, Many. Any others? Many. Steve says many. many <laughs> good, good. Median accuracy. <laughs> That is um, not committing. Yeah. Uh, any other? So 10, wow. 16, um, hang on, Meg, uh, 14, 15, 16. So we actually have a pretty wide range. Um, all joking aside, this is pretty much the range uh, that I get when I do this little experiment. 16, 15, 17, uh, 10's a little bit on the low end, um, but uh, you're in the ballpark. So you should feel good about that. You're in the ballpark. Now, uh, the real answer is 16. So if you got 16, clap yourself on the back. You are really good observers. I mean, really careful observers, because that's what this whole experiment is about. How careful of an observer are you? How many, let's see, how many got 16? I just want to kind of survey the room. Raise your hand or digital hand. All right, I'm seeing, a, I'm seeing a couple out there. Not bad, not bad. Now, let me ask a second question. How many of you saw uh, the person in the big gorilla outfit walk across the stage. Okay, interesting. Now, I have to say that's more than normal. That's more than normal. Um, uh, what about how many of you saw the curtain change color? Raise your hand. I see maybe just a few. Um, and how many of you saw a player from the team wearing black leave the stage? Anyone? A few. Okay, Barbara, Betty, good. How many of you have seen this video before, by the way? Is this familiar? Okay, a few of you. So if you've seen the video, kind of the cat's out of the bag about what this is all about. Um, let me review and let me show you what you miss. And then I want to explain what I think this is all about for our purposes. So let me bump over here. Okay, the correct answer is 16. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? If you didn't, your mind's going to be blown in a second. Did you like this before? About half missed the gorilla. That's probably about true for us, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's go back and watch. Let's rewind and watch it again. <laughs> Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. All right. So um, what are we doing? Why are we looking at gorillas and counting passes and that sort of thing? Well, here's my observation about the, and why I like this video and why I think it's relevant to people who are doing ministry and preaching and teaching in different capacities in the church. If I had asked you raise your hand when the big hairy gorilla comes on the stage. Do you think anyone would have missed it? No, right? It was blatantly obvious, right? If I said Janet, Lorna, Gail, raise your hand when the big hairy, or if I would have said, raise your hand when the curtain changes color, you all would have been locked in on that. And John and Jackie and Samantha, they would have gotten their hand up. Or raise your hand when someone from the team wearing black leaves the stage, right? Lorraine, Jen, Dorothy, hand would have gone up, you all would have gotten it. But I didn't ask that, did I? In fact, I made a big deal of counting how many passes uh, happened between the team wearing white. And so focused were you on my instructions about what to look for that some of you at least missed what was otherwise incredibly obvious in the picture. Make sense? Here's the analogy. I think that through our formation in the church, Many of us have been told to look for other things other than poverty when we read scripture. We've been told to look for the age of baptism, the nature of the Trinity, um, the relationship of works and faith, or maybe whether women should be ordained, uh, or maybe questions about homosexuality. All of those, hear me, friends, are important matters. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't pay attention to those parts of scripture or those topics. Far from it. What I am suggesting, though, is because the church has formed us in a certain way to look for certain things when we miss when we read scripture, we end up missing 
what is sometimes so obvious right there, those 2,000 or 10,000 verses about poverty or about shalom or about other things, we miss them even though they are right there in front of us. Just like we miss the gorilla and the curtain changing color and the team from the black, uh, the player from the black team leaving the stage. That's how obvious poverty is in the scripture. But we've been asked to look for other things. I think one of your roles as ministers and as preachers and as deacons is not just to preach about poverty, but is to ask the question, to help people, to, to even draw people's awareness to the amount of scripture that is about poverty. Ask them to look for the gorilla, if you will. In fact, uh, this is probably not possible, Peter, but what I would really love to do is give a homework assignment. And, and it's simple. It's, this is a really simple assignment. Forget everything you know about the Bible and then go read it from cover to cover again. So simple, right? Just, just do that this evening, maybe during your break. Um, I bet if somehow we could do that, if somehow we could scrape off everything we've been told to look for the Bible, and then you read it again for the first time, I think the topic about poverty would jump off the page. Like you could, you, you would be compelled to preach about it because your mind would say, wow, so much of this text is about poverty. How can't I bring that into the pulpit and into my ministry? Now, we can't do that, not only because it would be hard to read the Bible cover to cover tonight, but because we do come to Scripture formed and shaped uh, as we are. I'm not too worried about that. That's okay. But this is our opportunity to try to recalibrate our questions, come back to Scripture, and to wonder, really, what's there that we might have missed? What are the big hairy gorillas in Scripture that we have been told that we missed because we've been told to look for other things? So are you with me on that idea? Make sense? Steve, let me get you in on this. I just have a have a quick question. I hope I'm not jumping too far ahead no, or, go ahead. or into the weeds for that matter. But uh, that 2,000 verses you mentioned, does that yes. include uh, situations and conditions that relate to poverty, such as hmm. illness, marginalization, or even discussing in uh, discussing affluence in contrast mm -hmm. to poverty. Because I'm a big fan of the prophet Ezekiel. Yes, um, good question, Steve. And I would say the reason why that two thousand number is relatively low uh, is that um, it only includes the the texts that very explicitly talk about poverty and the needy. So, for instance, a critique of the wealthy would not be counted within that 2000, even though it's not hard to imagine a kind of discourse about economic conditions broadly and the activities of the wealthy having a lot to do with how poverty happens and, and what people experience. So that's why, Steve, I think it's 2000 at the very minimum and quite likely a good bit more. But thank you for that. Let me just see, we're gonna, we, uh, we'll move on to a few other points, but let me pause at this moment to see if there's any other questions uh, whether about the gorilla, the video, uh, these verses. By the way, I just put that uh, the link to that video into the chat in case you ever want to use it. I find it actually quite helpful with students, um, not just about poverty, but in, in talking about any issue that is actually quite prominent in scripture, but that are not on the radar screen of individuals. It's a nice way to sort of invite people into how obvious it is uh, that we miss things, even when it's in cl uh, plain sight. Questions, comments, or anything y'all want to lift up or yeah, want I have, me a to question. I have a question. Please. Um, right. So yeah, um, so what I noticed as you're talking was um in a way the Bible is about practical earthly well-being, both poverty and riches. So if you want to bump your numbers up, look for riches as well. And then yeah. then you'll see that yeah. it's really not about earthly, about spiritual well-being only, but earthly well-being, that's especially right. in the old testament. That's right. Yeah, perfectly cool. said, Miles. I think that's spot on, and it links with what Steve said. You know, again, if we had more time to talk about shalom, I think part of our problem with that concept is we understand shalom, or even the gospel mm -hmm. for that matter, to be good news, but we understand that good news to be like just in terms of when we die, we get to go to heaven. Um, no, I'm being a little uh, glib about that, and I, I want to be clear 
uh, that I think going to heaven is good. <laughs> so I'm not saying going <laughs> to heaven is not good, but I think what's good about the good news is so much bigger than just the promise of heaven once you die. What is so good about the good news, shalom, is the way in which God's reign and kingdom transform, or at least ought to transform, this very life. We don't have to die in order to get what get to what's good about Christianity. We are meant to live it and embody it and manifest it for others. And that's why um, there is so much emphasis on poverty relief and economic justice in the scripture, because the prophets and the Psalms and the wisdom traditions, they're inviting us to make it more shalomi now. And shalomi is not a real word, but it should be. Uh, but our task is to be bearers of shalom in the world uh, whether we're, we're ordained or not, or whatever our vocations are, we all are tasked as disciples to, to cultivate shalom. And shalom is that holistic. It's not just spiritual well-being, it's economics, uh, it's environment, it's really everything. In fact, I think the prophets, now I'm on a tangent, I apologize. I think the prophets would have been quite confused by our tendency to separate things into different spheres. Like, oh, that's economics and that's religion and that's politics. I think the prophets would have said, it's all shalom all the way down or it's all religion all the way down. Yeah. How we act economically is as much as in a barometer of piety, this is how often we pray. Um, what we do at the altar in the temple is as much of an act of devotion as what we do to the poor person that we pass on the street. The, the prophets would have been perplexed by some like distinction between religious piety and what we might today call like social activism or social justice. For the prophet, it was just, it's all shalom. It's all the work of God's kingdom uh, in this world, in the here and now. All right. I have a question about the, I have a question about the gorilla. Go, I'm sorry, yeah. you're asking serious questions and answering them. When you pointed out the gorilla, I thought I knew I had seen it. But I had edited it out in my brain because I wasn't. Is that a normal thing? Like I had it was there. I think I knew it was there when I saw the film. So had I edited it out somehow or? I, I think quite possibly, Joe. And it is very normal. In fact, um, there was this fascinating study um, where people, the scientists knew of this sociological study with the gorilla. And they wanted to see would it work with people who are really are trained to be great observers. And probably the best observers in the world are radiologists uh, in medicine because they're trained to look at films and scans and to notice the smallest amount of variations in color or shading. And it's a life or death matter for a radiologist because they're detecting cancer or other major diseases from these small variations of, of appearance. Well, anyway, these scientists imposed a little icon of a gorilla on all of these uh, uh, scans that radiologists had. And then they asked the doctors, well, yeah, sure, did you detect cancer? But did you see the gorilla? And actually like 95% of the doctors report having not seen the gorilla on the scan. And it's there in plain sight. So Joe, your experience is exactly what doctors experience in that experiments. And in fact, it seems like the, the better observers we are, the more focused we are on one thing, the actually the worse we become at spotting the gorilla. So there's like an inverse proportionality in a certain way. Um, it's fascinating stuff. Um, okay, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna uh, click back in to uh, my slides if I can find them here. Uh, and I want to continue on to just a few more points. Sorry, did that that did not work. Let me try this again. <laughs> um, hang on, I knew I would mess this up uh, at some point. Um, okay, let me try this again. There we go. I think that's the right one. Okay, did that come through? All right, good enough. Okay, so let's move on. We've done two points uh, so far. We've talked about the number of verses. We've also talked about how we tend to see what we are told to look for. That's what we just covered uh, with the gorilla experiment. I want to go to number three. This is an important one, I think. We tend to spiritualize, or maybe I might want to say we tend to over-spiritualize passages in Scripture that directly address poverty, right? So we see them, but we, but sort of in spite of ourselves or in spite of the text, we want to read as a spiritual commentary what in actuality is a pretty clear description of economic conditions. So consider Proverbs 31.9. 
speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Friends, this is relatively straightforward, at least as far as the Hebrew goes. The word for poor, ani, means to be without property. And the word for needy, avion, means to be want to to be in want in a physical uh, sense. These are clearly descriptors of physical and economic realities. However, we often assume that what is meant here is something like the poor in spirit, not the actual poor person, or the person who is facing a difficulty in their spiritual lives, not someone who is needy from the perspective of the basic needs of life. As a result, we conclude that defending the rights of the poor means providing a way for them to grow spiritually, get more involved in their faith, find support through Christian fellowship. None of that is bad. All of that, in fact, is consonant with the gospel. But I simply want to point out that a text like this is actually talking about material poverty, not spiritual poverty, but material poverty. It doesn't mean we can't use a text like this to talk about spiritual poverty. We certainly can. We've got the freedom to do that. But it's important to keep in mind that, that the original readers of this text would have understood this as a call to action for poverty relief. Not a call to pray, although again, I'm going to go on record that just as I think going to heaven is good, so do I think praying is good, but that's not what this text is calling us to do. This text in the wisdom tradition is calling us to be active in the world in relief of the condition of poverty, right? And what I'm suggesting happens here, oops, I'm a few clicks behind, um, what I'm suggesting it happens with this verse, I think actually happens with a lot of texts in scripture. A lot of texts that in their original context were speaking about material poverty, actually we read as speaking about something other than economics. And here to kind of, to, to, to sort of let you experiment with this, um, I wanna read a text that's actually gonna be a text very important uh, to Lent. Uh, if you were preaching later in Lent, you might actually come to this text at Psalm 22. But what I want to do here is I want to read parts of Psalm 22. And as I do so, I want to show you pictures of people who are actually experiencing poverty. And what I want to wonder, we're going to unpack this for a second. I want to ask at the end of this, what is it like to have these ancient words, this lament prayer that we often associate with Jesus? Um, what does it mean to hear those words as we see these images, right? Are you ready? Does that make sense? So here they are. I'm going to read. I won't read the whole thing, but I'm going to read enough to, to get the sense of it. A prayer for the poor, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. I am a worm, not a human. Scorned by others and despised by the people. All who seek me mock at me. They shake their mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near. And there is no one to help. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but he heard me when I cried. Let me ask, what was it like to hear those words and see those images at the same time? What did it, what did it do for you internally as you encountered this? Get a few of you to jump in on this. It sang louder to me. Uh, okay. 
I can't really explain it beyond that for the moment, but the words gained gained a tremendous amount of power. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Resonates with me. I'm seeing some nodding heads too. I think we, there's a common experience of this. Completely different meaning, Randy says, right? What would have been interesting to do is somehow download from your brain the images that typically run through your head when you hear Psalm 22 and then compare these to these, compare those to these, right? It's hard to see uh, with those words. It is hard to see, right? Some of those lines, um, they, I can count on my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes. To hear those words and then to see people for whom that is literally true, it's shocking. And I can't help but think that's the point of the psalm, is to shock us into recognition, to shock us into action, into a response. Other reactions to this? Anyone else want to share anything they felt or maybe something about the language they noticed. I was just, <clears throat> I was just going to say that when I hear the Psalms, I think I tend to identify with them myself and imagine myself in those situations. But in mm -hmm. fact, when we do it this way, it makes us, yeah, much more conscious of other people and you know the fact that, for the most part, we're doing okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. No, I appreciate that, Martha, because and certainly we can read the Psalms that way. And some of you, for all I know, might have or are now experiencing aspects of material poverty. But what you say, Martha, makes me think that maybe maybe I'm not the hero of this Psalm. Right. Maybe. What if I were the one, Ellen Davis, this wonderful Old Testament professor at Duke, maybe some of you know of her. She talks about when we read the laments and, and Psalm 22 is a lament. She talks about having the courage to turn the text 180 degrees, by which she means, what if we were the ones that caused the condition of the lamenter? What if we weren't the lamenter, but the one who made this lament a reality, right? And then the psalm has even a greater poignance, doesn't it? If I'm the one whose actions or maybe inactions have produced the people that we see on the screen, Ah, then those words are much different, aren't they, for us? And I just wanted to say one other brief thing, which is that it makes the Psalms a very eloquent voice for, for these people who maybe we don't, you know, uh, stop long enough to listen all the time to what they have to say. And maybe maybe they don't always articulate it in this very, you know, beautiful way that the Psalms do. But those words that speak so powerfully to us, these, mm -hmm. these are the voices of these people and so so oh, man so beautifully put martha that's right in these cases scripture is giving voice to those who too often have no voice in our society right so we're getting to overhear the experience of the poor even if or maybe especially if we don't typically run in to people experiencing material poverty on a regular basis in our lives right now, friends, I want to stress that it, 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 what I'm not saying is that you can only read Psalm 22 and imagine these pictures, or that it's impermissible for Kathy or Joanne or anyone else to read Psalm 22 and think about Jesus, or think about someone who's experiencing political persecution, or 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 homo uh, uh, discrimination, whether it's racism or homophobia, right? Yes, you can absolutely do that. What I'm inviting, though, is to practice, to exercise these muscles too, to read some of these laments or other parts of scripture, and instead of spiritualizing them away from economic reality, to actually embrace the economic reality, sit with the possibility that these texts might be talking about economics more than we often think. And then just use that as an experiment, as a holy experiment to see where that takes you. Where does it take your prayer life? How might it direct your preaching? How might you invite others in your congregations, in your parishes, into this type of experience, right? You might imagine your own little PowerPoint that does the same. Uh, or maybe you take another, maybe you take the Beatitudes or some other text that we often spiritualize um, and then say, well, what if Jesus was talking about people who were actually poor? not just poor in spirit, right? You, you could do this. It, I have found that this to be a way to open up some conversations around the reality of poverty. So I offer it to you if it, it might be something um, that's helpful. 
uh, let me move us on. We've got a few other points to make. Um, and I want to um, raise them quickly as we bring our time to a close. So we've done three things so far. We've noted that why are, is there such a gap between us and the early church when it comes to poverty relief? Number one, we tend to underestimate how much of the Bible is about poverty. Number two, we tend to look for what we've been told to look for, which is typically not poverty. And number three, even when we find the verses in Scripture about poverty, we tend to spiritualize or over-spiritualize them in a way that excludes the possibility of their economic reality. Here's the fourth reason. I think we often forget that Jesus was poor and probably homeless. Um, the world has come a decent way, a decent bit in terms of recognizing that Jesus was not white. Jesus did not have blonde hair and blue eyes, right? I mean, this now is obvious and should be obvious. On your left is the famous Warner Salmon, a painting which was in my grandmother's living room. Maybe it was in your grandmother's living room, or maybe it's in your own, um, where Jesus is portrayed as pretty much like a, a blonde-haired Caucasian. On the right, by the way, is this wonderful picture I found from, of all places, um, a uh, Scientific America sort of journal. And the, you know how like uh, they do those forensic sketches uh, for people who have committed a crime? Well, they hired someone to do a forensic sketch of Jesus based on what we know about where Jesus was born and when he was born. And this is the image they come, came up with, right? Um, fascinating. I think the, the church, particularly the white church, has made not enough but more progress in recognizing that Jesus was not blonde haired, blue eyed and white, but we've made relatively less con uh, progress in terms of recognizing that Jesus was not middle class. Jesus was not middle class. He was born in Bethlehem, a small impoverished uh, village in the shadow of Jerusalem. He grew up in Nazareth, another small village in the shadow of Sepphoris, the major economic center, though not mentioned in the Bible, kind of, uh, but looms large in Jesus's economic background. His ministry, Jesus's, was located in the villages of the Galilee, in the midst of people who were susceptible to heavy taxes laid upon them, not only by, um, not Pharaoh, uh, by Herod, uh, but also by the temple and other religious authorities. Jesus died so poor that his body had to be buried in the tomb donated by a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea. Friends, we have every reason to believe that Jesus was extremely poor and probably homeless. He wasn't just an itinerant minister. He probably just didn't have a home as well. That God became incarnate in the form of an impover impoverished man is something we should never lose sight of. For all I know, God could have become incarnate in any sort of body, in any sort of body, in any sort of economic reality. God could have become incarnate in a king or a priest or a judge or a prophetess or so many other different things. But God's word became flesh in the form of someone who not just ministered to the poor, but was poor himself. Now, maybe that's an obvious point to all of you. In fact, I hope it's an obvious point for all of you. But I have to admit, that point has not always been obvious to me. And I find that it's not always obvious uh, to the students and the pastors that I work with. Um, I lead trips to Israel-Palestine, uh, or at least I did before October 7th. And one of my favorite places was traveling to uh, uh, to. Uh, Mag not Magdala, why am I blanking on it? Uh, to Capernaum, thank you, there it is, Ryan. Uh, to Capernaum, where Jesus spent a lot of his ministry. It's where he performs his first miracle in the Gospel of Mark. There's so many cool things to see at Capernaum. Uh, but my favorite part of it is a statue that's easy to miss. It's on the left-hand side, just before you enter the gate uh, and see the old ruins of a fourth century synagogue. And here's what the statue looks like. It's a statue of a homeless man wrapped in a blanket, um, huddled, perhaps asleep, on a bench. This might be interpreted as any homeless man, but that it's meant to be Jesus is obvious if you look at one detail. Do you see it? Do you see the detail? The hole in the feet, where the nails driven into the cross, the mark that they leave. Um, friends, I think in many ways this might be the most accurate depiction of Jesus that we have. And I've often wondered, 
what if this image of Jesus hung from the front of our churches instead of a cross? I have no problem with a cross or even a crucifix, which I grew up with in the Catholic tradition. Um, I have no problem with that. But what if this was the image that people thought of? What if Christians walked around with chains around their necks and instead of having a, a cross, held this image of a homeless person? I'm not suggesting that we have to do that or that this image should be in every church, but it is. it does make me wonder what would happen if we began realizing that the word made flesh that we worship was in fact a poor person? Would it not change how we actually interact with poor people? Would we be more inclined to see the image of God in the homeless if this were our image of the Savior? I don't know. I don't know, but it would be worth some experimentation. So if anyone's kind of redoing the stained glass in your sanctuary or want to commission a piece of art, um, get in touch with Timothy Schmaltz, who is the author of this. He not only has the statue in Capernaum, but it's actually now in a number of different places, uh, even here in North America. Um, but it, it's a provocative image to think about. What if this were our image of our Savior? I need to move us on to a conclusion. So let me offer two final points. Um, scanning the room real quickly, how many of you have already preached your first sermon? Who are kind of like preaching veterans? Okay, that's most of you. It looks like most of you. A few of you might still have your first sermon upon you uh, up into the future. I remember my first sermon. Um, you get very nervous about what you preach on. At least I did. Uh, now, you might be an electionary type of context where the text is uh, selected for you. That's not bad. I had to choose the text I would preach on in my first sermon. And that was half of the weight of the world was on my shoulders in choosing that. Because in your first sermon, you just, you want something really meaningful. I tell my students, um, save something for your second sermon. Uh, you don't have to say it all in your first sermon. But nevertheless, the, the text you select matters. Well, I wonder if the same was true of Jesus. In Luke 4, we hear Jesus' first sermon, or at least it's his first recorded sermon. This is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And I, am, I wonder how Jesus chose the text that he chose to preach on uh, in Luke 4. He chooses um, Isaiah 61. It's not surprising that he turns to the Old Testament because, of course, that was just the Bible back then. It wasn't old yet. It was just Scripture. Um, and Jesus turns to some words from Isaiah 61, and it's instructive to me that Jesus begins his public ministry, not talking about heaven and hell, not talking about baptism, not talking about internal spiritual transformation, not even talking about prayer or fasting or anything like that. Jesus' first sermon is about poverty. Here's his text. He enrolled the scroll of Isaiah. And found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What jumps out to you uh, about this short passage that Jesus uses for his first sermon? Anything about the imagery or the language? Lifting of the yoke of oppression. Lifting of the yoke of oppression. Yeah. Let the oppressed go free. Very good. It's very physical, isn't it? Right? I don't think, here's where we might spiritualize this uh, and think that what Jesus means when he says to proclaim uh, release to the captives and bring good news to the poor is that he just wants to share the gospel with them. I'm sure Jesus is sharing the gospel with them, but I think he means something related to the actual uh, intervention on behalf of the people who are suffering in a very material and economic way. Um, consider, for instance, the word uh, anointed here. Jesus says, I have been anointed, or God has anointed me. In Greek, that word anointed is enchrisane, enchrisane. And if even if you haven't had any Greek, you might notice in that word enchrisane the root of the word Christ. And in fact, that's what it means. Um, God has anointed me or made me Messiah. Uh, and Christ, by the way, is just the, the Greek equivalent of Messiah. It's not, I, I grew up in the church. Here's a confession, Peter. 
I grew up thinking that Christ was Jesus's last name, just like I'm Ryan Bonfilio, uh, the Savior was Jesus Christ. In fact, Christ is not a last name. It's a title, meaning Messiah. And here Jesus is saying, God has anointed me, has made me the Christ in order to bring good news to the poor. Jesus's self-understanding is rooted in his ministry to the poor. It's intrinsic to what it means to be God's Messiah in the world. The other thing that strikes me about this uh, is, is that a lot of these activities that Jesus is talking about, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free, not only are all these addressing the material conditions of someone's life, but they happen out in the world. These activities, by and large, aren't meant to happen in the pews of the synagogue and later the church. These are the things you do once you leave the synagogue and the church. And even that, I think, is instructive, that Jesus is understanding the thrust or the trajectory of his ministry as one that begins in the pulpit and in the synagogues and or church, but ultimately is oriented out into the world. And isn't that, again, a perfect description of what you all are called to as lay preachers and as deacons, right? To bring the world to the church, the church to the world. The activity is, and hear me in this, I don't mean to say that going to church is unimportant, but, but at best, and really what it's meant to do is to be the engine and the catalyst that drives you out of the church, not forever, uh, <laughs> drives you out of the church and into the public square to enact. Uh, this, this, the good news that we have been called to proclaim. And so we're hearing, there's so much more we can say about this text, um, but here we're seeing that Jesus' ministry begins, um, and, and he roots theologically his mission in this idea of caring for the poor. Let me give you one last idea, and then I need to, to let you all go. Um, I think sometimes in the church that we tend to think that poverty relief is someone else's job. The church's job is to pray, to proclaim, uh, to be a house of prayer, but ultimately it's someone else's job to take care of poverty. Well, I'll simply say that, uh, as we saw in the very beginning, we're coming back full circle, that for at least the first 300 years of Christianity, um, this was not assumed to be the case. The work of the church was to address the material realities of the world, and that wherever the gospel spread, this ministry of poverty relief was to come with it. We see it here in Acts 4 in the work of the, uh, of the earliest followers. Now, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possession, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. That's the line I want to highlight. Um, this is not a text about socialism or communism or any of the other nonsense I sometimes hear. This is about a community who's magnetized by Jesus's example and wants to make a difference when it comes to economics. And apparently, friends, it was working. There was not a needy person among them. That wasn't because there weren't needy people uh, in and around Jerusalem at this time. It was because the earliest disciples were addressing that reality. In fact, if we read a little bit later, and I'll end on this, um, when we come to Acts 17, when the disciples and Paul and others would go to these towns in the Mediterranean world and they would proclaim the gospel, it would cause quite a bit of stir. It would cause some controversy. And we see one of those, th those controversies in Acts 17 where uh, the people who are selling idols in the marketplace, they're mad uh, at the disciples for preaching Jesus because it was going to uh, expose their uh, their industry as fraudulent. No one would need idols once they follow Jesus. But their complaint to the city magistrates in Acts 17 was this. These people, meaning the disciples who were preaching the gospel, they, they say these people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also. Friends, there's a really good word in Greek for world. Uh, it's cosmos like as in cosmic, right? But interestingly, that's not the word used here. The word used and gets translated as world is oikonomia. And if you even hear that word, what does it sound like? Economy. This is the Greek basis of the word economy. What these people were, were claiming about the earliest disciples were not that they were just turning the world upside down with their religious ideologies or their faith practice. 
they were saying these earliest disciples were turning the economy upside down. That's how the early church was known, all the way back into the Roman uh, Empire that we talked about at the very beginning. The church was known for turning the economy upside down insofar as they radically cared for the most needy among uh, God's people. And so friends, um, I want to end by just saying, what would it look like in your ministry, in your preaching, to take these ideas more seriously, to allow these texts and this tradition of the early church to inform what you bring into the pulpit, the texts you read, the ideas you reflect on? How does it reshape who you are as a follower? Um, I realize that this might raise more questions than it answers. And Peter, I think I'm okay with that for today. I hope these conversations are helpful to you and encouraging. Um, I will say that knowing that we're out of time before we're really out of the topic, um, I'm gonna put my email through in the chat. If this is ever something you wanna read more about, think more about, converse on, I would be happy to share resources or continue that conversation. So I'm just gonna pop that email through um, to you all. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Peter, thank you, Meg and everyone else. Uh, it's been great. Uh, I know I've now gone a minute over, and I'm sorry for that. But it's great being uh, being with you all this afternoon. Ryan, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> there's so much, so much to think about and dig into there. But you start the process beautifully. I sit here thinking that we need many more armies of deacons out in the world. That this is really what the work yeah. is all about. Amen. Uh, and you all are do doing it, but it's a big challenge to um, to pull that off in the pulpit because it is turning the world upside down. Thank you.